Hi, everyone. By my count, there's like eight other things you could be doing, including not working, I mean, not doing anything or going and doing some work, and you chose to come in here, so thanks for that. Um, my name is Human. I'm going to talk to you about CDNs today. I'm the VP of technology of a company called Fastly. Um, we have an hour. I don't know if I'm going to talk for an hour, but I do have a lot of things to tell you. Um, how many people know what a CDN is? Wow, that's great. And how many of you are using a CDN? I'm really glad that the first number was bigger than the second number. That's great. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about CDNs. I'm probably going to, I'm going to take you through a journey. I'm going to probably tell you some things that you already know. Hopefully, I'll tell you some things that you don't know. And my goal is this is a successful hour for us if at the end of this, you have some ideas, some new ideas that you maybe didn't have before, some new ways of using the CDN that apparently all of you are using. So that's great news. Um, and that's how I'm sort of going to do this session. I have like a hundred and some odd slides, so there's a lot of stuff to tell you. But hopefully at the end of this, you'll have um, some new ideas or some new ways of thinking about what you think is a CDN, but is actually a lot more. Um, so just to review, uh, CDN is a globally distributed network of caches spread all over the world. Uh, CDN caches cache content, maybe do some other things. And depending on which vendor you look at, footprints vary. Uh, this is what ours looks like, but depending on, I mean, I only have an access to our map. Depending on which vendor you look at, yes, this map will vary. And CDN has a bunch of benefits, but you can probably distill everything down to uh, three. Things are faster because you've gotten your content closer to your users. You get a lot of stuff offloaded from your origin, so your origin costs will go down. The amount of uh, processing that's um, taking place at your origin servers will go down. And you can do a lot more um, with a CDN, and that's sort of going to be the crux of this uh, conversation. But we're going to start somewhat um, basic. We're going to start with the notion of caching. This is what CDNs were built for, and this is one of the first things that everybody thinks about when they think about CDNs. So we're going to start with caching. We'll start with basic. We'll do some cool things, and then we'll get into some concepts that um, maybe help you look at a CDN in a way that you haven't looked at it before. Caching was introduced to all of us in this beautiful document called RFC 2616 in 1999. Section 13, chapter 13 of 2616 was dedicated entirely to caching. Uh, I'm proud to say I've probably read it 100 times. I'm also only going to say that to this room. Um, uh, you may not know, however, that about four years ago, three years ago, um, the 2616 was actually divided into six different RFCs, and there was an entire RFC dedicated to caching, RFC 7234, which obviates 2616, but um, is most of the same concepts and adds a few clarifications, if you will. These documents gave us the beautiful cache control header, uh, which gives us a lot of knobs and levers when it comes to caching our content. When used in responses, it gives us basically a directive to instruct upstream caches for caching different things. You've probably seen this header before. This is me telling an upstream cache to cache a thing I'm serving it for a year. That's uh, numbers in seconds. So if you have a user that's coming to a CDN and the CDN that's coming to origin and you put this header on it, essentially what you're doing is you're telling the caches in the world that they can cache this thing that you're serving them for a year. The problem is you're actually directing every cache, which includes the CDN cache and that cache in your browser. Your browser has an HTTP object cache. You're telling them both the same thing. Sometimes you may not want to do that. You may want to tell them two different things. So the spec also defines a second directive called smaxh. Now don't ask me why the hyphen is between max and age in the first one and between s and max age in the second one, why it's okay to not hyphenate it in one, I have no idea. But I guess there's a one hyphen limit. Uh, but the S stands for um, shared. And what this does is essentially sends out two different directives to the, to the world. MaxAge, in this case 600, directs the browser to cache that thing for 10 minutes. And 604800, which I think is like a week in uh, seconds, uh, directs every shared cache, which in this case would be a CDN cache. So that's cool. That's a second directive that lets us sort of granularly cache things in the ether. But sometimes you have another cache. You have another shared cache, a corporate cache, a middle box cache, whatever, that's sitting upstream still from a CDN. And maybe you want to direct them all to do caching differently. 
The spec, the original spec doesn't give us a mechanism, but there is a second header. So what the SMAX stage does here is it essentially directs both the CDN node and the shared cache to cache things the same way. And if you don't want that, if you want that to be granular, there's a second header called surrogate control, which isn't a standard, but a lot of CDNs actually uh, implement this. And what this does is it lets the cache control headers direct the way the browser cache and a shared upstream cache cache something. And the surrogate control essentially um, invokes caching in the CDN. Um, for a little while, and I think it still happens, CDN caches or reverse proxies were known as surrogates. So this is why this header is called um, surrogate control. So this is a way for you to use cache control headers or HTTP headers in general to direct different caches upstream to cache things differently for you. A lot of times we see a lot of people that want to do things granularly upstream, and this is a way to do that control. Now, the, the, the seconds that's uh, included in these headers is essentially how long something is allowed to be cached for. Better put, what this actually means is once those seconds run out, that content on the cache becomes stale. And when content becomes stale, technically a cache is still allowed to store it, but it can't serve it without doing something called validation or revalidation. Revalidation happens to something called a validator. If you've ever heard of last modified or e-tags, those are official validators in the, in the spec. And what happens is a request comes into the CDN node for that piece of stale content, and the CDN says, or the cache, any cache, says I have this content, but I can't serve it because it's stale now. It ran out of seconds, like my max age ran out. So what it's gotta do is it's gotta send a request to origin, essentially saying, can I keep serving this thing? It's, that's called the revalidation, or validation. And the origin can respond with a 304, which you've heard before, which is basically, hey, what you got is good, keep serving it, that's a non-modified, or worse yet, the origin can actually send an entire new piece of content, which says, what you have is gone, it's over, I have something new for you. This line is, is bigger because that content actually involves data, where if it was a 304, it's just a single, like a, just a header that says, single packet that says nothing. Um, that just says you can keep using what you have. In this case, it's actually giving you new content. The problem with this is this takes time. And that's not good because you still, even though you're serving the thing that you have in your cache, you took a little bit of time to get to origin to revalidate it. And usually with CDNs, your users are hitting a CDN cache that's not necessarily close to your origin. So that takes a lot of time, network time. Uh, from the west coast of the US, the east coast of the US is roughly 70 milliseconds round trip. And that could end up uh, adding up. So um, this is what you kind of have to go through once you end up with stale content, and this is how you validate it. However, sometimes you're okay serving stale content for small periods of time um, while you're still doing this validation. And if you're okay with that, there is help. The RFC 5861 showed up not too long ago. Well, I guess it's seven years now, so it's long ago now. And essentially, it's an extension that defines a couple of extra cache control directives for handling stale content. The idea behind this RFC is, if you're okay serving stale content, we're gonna give you some knobs. And the knobs come in the way of two directives. One is called stale while revalidate. And what this means is you gotta cache that object for that many seconds, which is I think is a week, and then when it goes stale, while you're revalidating it, so for that round trip time to origin, you can, you, can, you can serve the stale piece for 60 seconds. That's what this means. So this essentially allows you to not lose performance while you're revalidating if you're okay serving something stale for a short period of time. And that's a great piece of control because a lot of times we are actually okay with serving stale content. We just don't wanna keep doing it. We are okay with doing it for a little period of time. So normally we see this pattern where you cache something for a long time and for a short period of time you allow the serving of the stale version of that object. There's a second directive in this RFC called stale of error. And the idea here is that you can serve that object if your revalidation attempt to origin returned with an error. If, in other words, you can't hit the origin. If there's an error condition. This is great for protecting yourself against downtime, essentially. So we see a lot of people that tag their content with one of these two directives to allow better handling of stale content while some, when something becomes stale. So through these cache control directives, the RFCs essentially allowed us, gives, gave us a lot of law, knobs and levers to cache things with some level of granularity. Now, there's a question of what we cache and when we cache them. And this brings us to a discussion of the different types of content. And to talk about the different types of content, I'm gonna take you back in time 
to the beginning of time, or 1998, uh, where our content was essentially divided into two categories. Static content, which was most of it, images, JavaScript, CSS maybe back then, um, uh, lots of pictures basically, and dynamic content, which is what we basically called everything else. And this was maybe the, 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 the breakdown. Uh, we got better, we got smarter, uh, the web became 2.0, a whole bunch of other buzzwords entered our world, and maybe this breakdown turned into this. So there was more dynamic content. We learned about something called Ajax, it was fascinating, it was a great time to be alive. And what we did is we saw the world through this lens. Half of our shit was static, half of our shit was dynamic, and what we, what we essentially, when it came to caching, we said all the static stuff is cacheable, and all else we're gonna call dynamic, and we're gonna make that not cacheable. This is the, the, the conundrum we put ourselves in. And this is actually a huge disservice we're doing to ourselves, and it turns out that this is not actually true. There is a third type of content. It isn't uh, static and else. There's actually a third type of content, and for um, the best way we could describe it, we call it event-driven content. So the idea is this, you have static content which you know about, you have dynamic content that is absolutely uncacheable, under no circumstances can you cache it, those things exist. And then there's this third category called event-driven. Event-driven content is an imposter. It acts like static, uh, like dynamic. It looks like it's dynamic content, but it's actually cacheable. The problem with it is, it's unpredictable how long you can cache it. You don't know how long you can cache it a priori. You have no idea. Uh, let's take a, let's say you're hosting a Game of Thrones wiki and you have a page for your favorite character and that thing is, looks exactly like that for a long period of time. Then a horrible death falls upon your character. There's dragons, there's zombies, there's molten metal, um, there's dogs, all sorts of shit. And, you're, and, you're, and your favorite character dies and that page gets edited like 300 times in five minutes. Right? That is a piece that you could not predict beforehand. You had no idea there were going to be dogs. So you don't know ahead of time that there's a certain cache control header you can um, put on this content. This is the problem with event-driven content. Because we don't know ahead of time, because it's unpredictable, uh, we kind of always thought of it as uh, dynamic. And with that is a thing, it's a disservice we uh, did to ourselves. So let's review, and then I'm gonna talk to you about how to handle event-driven content. Three types of content. We have static content. These things change infrequently, and we know ahead of time how long we can cache them for. Examples are things like images in JavaScript and CSS. And cache control headers here are enough. We know how to deal with these. These are very well defined. We put a cache control header on there, cache it in the ether, and everything's cool. Then we have dynamic content, which is totally uncacheable, absolutely cannot be cached, uh, has to go to origin all the time, and this is handled with CDNs through a mechanism called DSA, uh, or dynamic site acceleration. That's just one of the names that's used. Um, and the way we mark this for CDNs to let them know that they can't cache it is also defined in the spec. We know, we use no cache, no store headers. Um, we can also put a, a private directive on there. There's a number of directives that we can put on cache control headers that essentially tells middle caches never to cache it. And you send this through a CDN, CDNs handle dynamic content different ways. They um, usually go from the CDN node to origin and do some fancy TCP things to sort of accelerate the delivery, or better yet, they do this symmetric transport where they have uh, big channels between two CDN nodes and lots of TCP things happen between those nodes, and that's even more optimized, and that's the way CDNs generally handle them. This is stuff that's totally 100% non-cacheable, totally dynamic content. Then we have this third category called event-driven which is static, but it's unpredictably static. We don't know ahead of time how long we can cache it for. Um, stories are new stories, like uh, examples are new stories like we talked about, wikis like we talked about, sports scores, stocks, a whole bunch of stuff that actually falls under this category. And we don't have cache control headers for this. We don't have, the spec didn't give us a mechanism to cache these things by, so we're screwed. The problem is these things are so cool if you cache. Here's a waterfall chart. You guys have all seen waterfall charts before, right? Raise your hands if you have. Thank you. If you haven't, please go get yourself familiar with water waterfall charts. It turns out that most of like base HTML falls into this category. In fact, a lot of CMSs by default 
tag their base HTML with cache control headers that make them uncacheable because that's the safe way to do it. Now here's a waterfall chart where I've put everything that's not the base HTML on a CDN. You'll see all those little green um, portions of those bars. That's the time to first byte. Everything is small for all the static objects, but it's huge for the dynamic object because that thing has to go home. That thing, that call is incredibly blocking. Look at the benefit I get from moving that. Look, boop, boop. That's a lot of performance benefit that I can get from caching that one particular object on a, on a CDN, but I can't because I don't know ahead of time how long I can cache it for. Uh, and the reason I can't do this, and the reason I there's this, I'm, I'm in, in a mess, in a bind with this, is because the spec never gave us a mechanism to do this, to do invalidation. This is our conversation now about invalidation, which is a roundabout way of saying how we can solve this problem. And I'll get you there in a second, but first the history lesson. Here's RFC 2616. And the word cache appears on that RFC 616 times. So the RFC gives us lots of mechanisms, lots of, lots of talk about caching. How many times do you think the word invalidation shows up? If you had to guess. You can't guess. <laughs> seven times. And the seven times is like one in, a, in the table of contents. <laughs> It's like three or four times in one little section that says if you do a put, you have to invalidate. And then one time in that one section at the end that has to talk about security, which is like the obligatory security section every RFC needs to have. That's all. That's RFC didn't give us invalidation uh, mechanisms. And it's not like we didn't try. There's actually, there used to be an RFC or a draft that never became an RFC for invalidating. Because invalidation is hard. This, was a, this is a difficult problem. So what we did with this, so we've never had a way to handle proper invalidation. So for these types of content, this event-driven content, what we did instead is we either made them dynamic and we put this header on there, or we thought we were smart and we would put like very short uh, TTLs or max age on these objects. In this case, five minutes. Basically what happened when we did this is that number, that 300, was essentially our threshold for making mistakes. Basically, what that was, was how long we were comfortable with making a mistake about the cacheability or the staleness of something. Let me tell you a story. A very, very well-known news organization. I can't tell you who, but I will tell you that they're like Alexa 200. Um, uh, did this. This was their way they would do it. And they would tag every news story, so the base HTML of every news story, with a 10-minute max age, because that was sort of what they thought they were comfortable with um, when it came to caching uh, what they thought was dynamic, but it was actually event-driven content. So they published this story about Britney Spears. True story, I'm not making this up. Uh, published a story about Britney Spears, put a 10-minute time to live on it, sent it out into the world, and two minutes later realized that they made a mistake. And what they published was actually false. So for the next eight minutes, they were panicking and terribly, terribly uh, um, not happy because they thought they'd be okay with 10 minutes of mistakes when they actually weren't. And for eight minutes, they were basically um, panicky. What they actually needed was this cache control header, which doesn't exist. Uh, they wanted a way to be able to get something out into the ether, and then when that mistake is made, to basically remove it from the ether, which brings us to a topic which is known as uncaching by no one, Everybody calls it purging. And in CDNs, CDNs purging is essentially the way that you uncache something from the CDN. Now, purging is actually a really easy problem with a single cache. It's a really difficult problem with a global network of caches because you have to propagate that and you have to kind of do it quickly. So, um, so okay, if, we, if, we, if we purging is a mechanism, we can solve this problem. We publish the story about Britney Spears. We find out two minutes later that, um, it's, a fault. It's, it's, it's incorrect, so let's purge it. Uh, so this, this, the remainder of this story is that this company, um, this news agency, did that. They're like, hey, we have a purging mechanism with our CDN. Let's get the thing off the CDN. Great. They push the button, and they realize the purge time for that particular CDN was like 18 minutes. So it would take them 18 minutes to get this thing off. It, it had eight minutes left in his, in his TTL, so there was no point. So this only works if it's instant. The way you deal with event-driven content, which is a lot of content, is you cache it for as long as you want, cache it as if it was a static piece of content, send it to your CDN, and when it changes, you know that it's changed in your application. 
Lots of applications know this origin side. What you do is you send a purge to the CDN, and if it gets off the CDN instantly, that gives you an incredible new set of tools to cache things that you couldn't cache before. And this is an incredibly powerful mechanism, except that instant bit is very important. It has to be instant, otherwise this won't work. Let me give you an example. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not picking on WordPress to pick on WordPress. This just happens to be the first logo I found for a CMS. And I have a site example, which was also on WordPress. So I'm not picking on them. This applies to lots of uh, mechanisms like this. The way we handle this sort of content before, let's say you have a blog. Let's say you have a thing on WordPress or any CMS. Your users come in, they go through CDN, they come to your origin, and you make edits to your piece of content, you may have comments to your piece of content, and because that could happen at any time, you can change things or people can come in and comment at any time, you always make this piece of, this object, this, this base object, uncacheable to the CDN. So it never got cached on the CDN, and this is what your waterfall looks like. This terrible, very, very green waterfall that has lots of blocking calls because you could not cache this thing on the CDN because you're afraid, you're deathly afraid of serving stale content. That's just what our world was like before. Now things are different. Now your users come in and they go to your uh, origin and what you serve is you serve your content back with a cool max age time that says cache it for a long time. This is also not a real max age directive. Don't use it or if you do, write me so I can use an actual example in the next time I do this presentation. <laughs> And this object goes into the cache and stays in the cache. And from that point on, when the users come in and fetch it, hey, you serve it from your cache. Everything's faster, everybody's happy, that's awesome. Now let's say you gotta make an edit at origin or people come in and comment at origin. Well, cool, I have a purge mechanism. I just send a purge to the CDN node. The object goes, boop, it disappears. It actually makes that noise. It disappears, and now you have, basically you start everything from scratch. And this has to be instantaneous. If that boop, took 20 minutes, this would not work. This has to be instantaneous. And once you have that mechanism, now you have basically an ecosystem to cache things that you couldn't cache before. Uh, your users come in, they go back to your origin, they grab things, they put it on, the, you, you get to cache things on the CDN, the, you basically rinse and repeat. So this is an incredibly powerful mechanism, if you have it, it's an incredibly powerful mechanism to let you cache more. This lets you cache things you couldn't cache before, and if you're using a CDN, the whole point of it is for you to cache things as close to your users as possible, and you want to cache more. You have to cache as much as you possibly can with a CDN, and this is one of the mechanisms that allows that. To talk about caching and caching more, we need to have a conversation about cache hit ratios, because this is the way CDNs generally tell you how well you're caching. You've seen a number like this from a CDN. You look at it, you're like, hey, cool, 98% cache ratio. I am just getting amazing performance from a CDN. It's awesome, everything's amazing. The problem with this number is that it's calculated through this formula. Basically, what this means is if you shoot 100 requests into a CDN and only one of them makes it to your origin, the CDN will tell you have a 99% cache hit ratio. In your head, you think this means 99% of your responses came from the edge of the network closest to your users, except that is not true because this formula doesn't account for where the object came from. It just says how many didn't make it to origin. And to understand that, we need to have a discussion about long tail content. I'm gonna go through a uh, very, very advanced cartoon, uh, like Pixar grade cartoon to explain long tail content to you. This is the beginning of our cartoon. Here's a CDN, you have your user sitting here and you have the, the origin and let's focus on one of the caches. One of the, ca I know this is the cartoon, I know this is the end of it, don't worry, there's nothing else coming, this is it. Let's focus on one of the caches. Your user makes a request to the cache to get a piece of object, that request starts with a TCP connection, right? And then it comes an HTTP connection, an HTTP request to say, hey, give me this piece of object. Now. That object, when that request is arriving at the edge cache, that object could come from the memory of that edge cache, it can come from the disk of that edge cache, and that disk better be an SSD, and if it's not, that's even a different performance profile, and for every one of these steps, depending on where the object comes from, the performance profile of that response changes. So how fast it is when it comes to memory is very different than how fast it is when it comes from SSD, from a spinning disk, excuse me, or from deeper in the network, which is what usually happens. If that edge cache doesn't have it, there's some sort of parent or sister cache that'll go to, to fetch something. And this performance profile changes the deeper it goes into your network. 
usually the hottest stuff is cached at the very edge. And the colder things are cached somewhere else in the network, probably where the denser or some mid-tier caches are. Except that entire chain is considered a hit, is considered a cache hit in that cache hit ratio calculation that we talked about. And you can see that it is a disservice to consider for performance, it's a disservice to consider the entire thing as good as serving something from the edge. So this traditional calculation isn't actually good enough for us to be a performance indicator. This is something that gives us a better uh, inclination, better idea of what our performance is and how we're calculating our performance. In, in fact, requ total request basically is the number of hits and the number of misses that we got at the edge of the network. Now, this doesn't mean the old calculation is useless. In fact, they're both very useful. The old calculation is a great indicator for offload. It tells us very well how much traffic didn't make it to our origin, which is an important metric. We want to know this. However, it is not a performance metric. This new thing is a performance metric. And it's important to get both of those things from your CDN. Most CDNs will only give you the one on the left. If they don't give you the one on the right, they should give you mechanisms at least for you to calculate that because that is an important metric that we generally have not taken into account when we think about CDNs. Let me show you how this translates to performance. Here's a test. Can you see the yellow lines? If you can't, just take my word for it that there's a yellow line there and they're all the same. What we've done here, this is a test that we do to evaluate CDNs, including ours. I won't tell you who this is. I won't tell you who any of the CDNs are that I'm about to show you because the, the story, the, the, the core of the um, um, lesson is the same no matter who they are. So this, is, I'm testing three different pieces of object. I'm testing a super popular object. I'm testing an object that's like a medium tail. That's not a real world, I made it up. Word, I made it up. But basically means it's an object that's fished somewhat infrequently, in this case, once an hour from the CDN and then a long tail object that's fetched once every six hours from the CDN. So these are infrequently fetched things. But the first one on the, on the left is something that's actually fetched frequently. That's a popular object. Now if you notice, the yellow line is TCP times. That's TCP connect time. And if you look, they're roughly the same. Of course they're the same because you're connecting to an edge cache and you're connecting, you're establishing a TCP connection with that edge cache. It doesn't matter if the content is there or not. Your TCP times are generally the same. But look at what happens to time to first byte as we go from left to right. That's the time to first byte for a super popular object. This is one something that's fetched once every hour, and this is something that's once every, fetched once every six hours. Isn't, doesn't that give you a new picture that the yellow lines didn't give you? And this shows you how the long tail content affects the performance of the objects that are served. And this is why that second formula, that second cache hit ratio, cache hit ratio from the edge is important. Isn't this better? So when you look at how your CDN is serving content, you kind of want this. Regardless of how frequently or infrequently your objects are fetched, you kind of want the same performance profile. Let me widen it for you. Here's a test, same test. What I just showed you was a one month uh, period of time. It was testing over one month. This is a different period of time. It's three weeks worth of, worth of uh, tests uh, in the US, seven CDNs. And this blue bar is the, the median, the 50th percentile of time to first byte for a very, very popular object. And you'll see that there are some differences, but they're kind of roughly the same. The problem is many, many, many business decisions, important business decisions are made based on this graph where everything is one or two milliseconds apart because this is the way most people test CDNs. They take a piece of content, like they take an image from their homepage, they shove it into a testing network, and they, they fetch it a billion times. And that thing is super hot. It was hot to start with, the testing made it hotter, so it's the hottest of the hot. And they get this graph. And this graph is misleading, because when you add, when you factor in long tail content, look what happens to these bars. Here's something that's fetched once an hour, Here's some, uh, something that's fetched once, sorry, the first one was once every six hours. Here's something that was fetched once every 12 hours. And here's something that was fetched once every 24 hours. Isn't this much more telling about how these CDNs perform for the content? That blue bar was just the tip of the iceberg. Well, how they really are serving your content is based on how freq frequently it's fetched. And when we look at the 95th percentile, even more gets exposed and even more so at 99th. And this is a different way of looking at CDN performance, and this is why it's important to take into account long tail content 
and your cash hit ratio is at the edge. The cash hit ratio, the one number that gives you global cash hit ratio is not necessarily an indicator of performance. And this is why. And when we think about which CDN is best for us, it's a very different picture than if you just considered those blue bars. This is basically a, a, the, 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 an artifact of how a CDN caches objects and how what their storage model is, and also how what their eviction model is, how they evict content, because CDNs are shared caches. At some point, they're gonna evict something. You may cache something. You may say, I want something cached for a year. There's no way any CDN is gonna cache it for a year. But, so, because there's always an eviction model, uh, eviction mechanism. But how they cache it and where they cache it vary widely across CDNs, as you just saw. And this is where, as you look at CDN performance, that's a thing you want to take into account. So at the end of our caching discussion, our takeaway is we want to cache as much as possible. And that includes what we previously considered uncacheable, what we called event-driven here, or long-tail content, which appears to be cached maybe at the edge of the network, but isn't always. And we have ways of exposing that. So we want to cache as much as we can. We want to cache as much as we can at the edge. And we want to maintain control over that cacheability, which is essentially what our purge mechanism gave us. Cache control is one way to do it, but purging and uncaching instantly is another way. Control is a great thing to talk about. Maybe we should have an entire discussion on it. So now I want to talk about control. So we're going to move away from caching, and we're going to talk about some things that um, maybe you don't necessarily think about when you think about CDNs, but hopefully you do. And if you um, don't, by the end of this, hopefully you will. Control is the idea of being able to have full uh, programmability and um, full uh, say into how a CDN is dealing with your content. I'm gonna tell you a story, to talk, to, for this discussion, I'm gonna tell you a story about control, and that is the story of The Guardian, the, the, the newspaper. Uh, Patrick Hammond from The Guardian did a talk a little while ago, and in that talk he had this slide. Uh, this slide shows a screenshot from a tool called Riffraff, which was a, a tool that the uh, Guardian open sourced. Actually, the Guardian open sources everything. They're amazing with this. Every tool they build, they open source. And Riffraff was their deployment tool. It was a way that they deployed code. Uh, and this was a screenshot that said, you know, something was being deployed. What was really interesting in this is he was showing here basically their CDN uh, config. What was really interesting is, I don't know if you can see it. Let's see how it says build number 1374. What that means is that this was their 1,374th version of config they'd pushed to the CDN. That's amazing. This is exactly the way you operate and the, exactly the same way that you interact with any service, any cloudy service that you interact with. This is what you expect. You want to iterate quickly. You want to be able to push code, uh, fall back to code, roll things back. And in his example, this was 1,374, the version 1,374. And this is powerful. The reason this is interesting is if we had this conversation 10 years ago, this was impossible because pushing config to a CDN took three hours, four hours. There was no way we could operate and develop and deploy things the way we do today with CDNs of the past. And this is essentially a lesson in programmability. We already talked about having a granular API for purging, the APIs. We work in the world of APIs. We want to have a config API. We want to be able to push configs, uh, remove things from us, roll back configs, all this stuff instantly. We want all of this to be quick. And we want to be able to run logic at the edge to be able to essentially control the traffic as it comes through the, it's our traffic, as it comes into the CDN and flows to our origin, or it doesn't. Maybe we surf things from the edge. And again, all of this works if it's instant. We want this instant um, interaction with the CDN. We want to programmatically control it. We want to programmatically control our content. We want to programmatically control caching. We want to programmatically control everything about the CDN. And we want to be able to run code at the edge, because, which is essentially programmatically being programmatic at the edge. So what does control at the edge mean? It means taking some of the logic that we have, and we've traditionally been thinking about it as things that we have to run at origin and running it at the edge of the network. The example that I have for you is a Fastly example, but it's not the only example. Any CDN should be able to give you this. In our case, we are based on Varnish, so we use VCL, which is the Varnish config language. If you've never seen it, it looks like this. Here's a little snippet. It's essentially a, a config language that kind of reads like a script. 
So you have like a lot of if-then statements and you basically run through a bunch of logic as you deploy VCL. But again, this is not specific to Varnish. This is just an example. Any CDN that you use, any CDN that you've ever used or will ever use, should give you a mechanism to let you have control and programmability and logic running at the edge. That is a powerful mechanism that a CDN can offer you to let you have control over your traffic. It's a delivery network and it's your traffic that's being delivered, you want control over it. You don't want the CDN to be a black box. We've looked at CDNs as black, as black boxes for far too long and mechanisms like this help us not think of them that way. Let me give you an example. And the example I'm gonna give you is one of edge generated content. It's not the only example, there's lots of examples of logic and I'll give you some lists uh, but this example is one I like. So in this example, basically what's happened is the, is, the, is the end user comes to the CDN node and makes a request for a GOIP thing. And it's JSONP, so there's a little JSONP function in the URL. And two cool things happen here. Three cool things, actually. One, the, the GOIP information is generated straight from the CDN node. So that stuff is basically based on the client's IP address and we basically construct a JSON at the edge. This is control of the edge. Construct a JSON at the edge and serve it to the client. The other cool thing is we basically had the ability to extract the function name from the URL and shove it back into the content. That's kind of cool too. And the third cool thing is there's no line to origin. The origin is sort of just there because it needs to exist, I guess. But in this case, this is an example of using a CDN for something, maybe it's a very simple example, but we've done two things. We've generated content at the edge, synthetically, if you will, and we've taken, we've made that content be dependent on the URL that came in. So we did some, some funny stuff, some logic as, at the same time. And we kind of created a thing that doesn't need an origin, which is really cool. So when we talk about logic at the edge, there's lots of examples. Everything from request routing to header manipulation and load balancing to geofencing to tokenization, authentication, uh, anything that falls in their um, logic that we can run close to our users. Device detection, microcaching, being able to uh, have configurable cache keys. So we have an example where um, somebody cached hotel search results based on uh, latitude and longitude. So for the same URL, you get different requests if you're making a request from Penn Station in New York versus where you, if you're making requests from Central Station in Baltimore, which is really cool because that's a configurable cache gain. That's an example of running logic and having control over your content at the edge. And again, it all has to be instantaneous. If you're going to code things for the edge, you better be able to deploy that code quickly and instantly. Otherwise, none of this will work. And as you deploy code, you better see what's going on. And this brings us to a discussion on visibility. As you're doing all this, as you're iterating quickly and rolling things out, you kind of want to see what's going on. And that's visibility. We've talked about APIs, but APIs don't end with how you purge something or how you configure and roll out config. APIs also have to do with statistics and uh, metrics that you want to see from your CDN. So any CDN that you're using better have a stats API, better, ha better give you network stats, HTTP stats, anything that has to do with caching, they better come. And it has to be in real time. Now there's value in historic data, but it's a lot cooler when you're having stuff roll to you and you're seeing what's going on in real time. It's not cool to see a spike five minutes after it happens. If a spike is happening to your traffic, you better see it as it's happening. So that's, you want real-time analytics. You also want real-time logging. So there used to be a time where CDNs would maybe give you log files once a day, five times a day, once an hour, whatever, batch jobs. And that was never good enough. You want real-time logs because there's a lot of things you can do with logs as they're rolling in. Also, it's a security feature. It's much better if a CDN is not storing any of your stuff. What that means is you have traffic that's coming to the CDN and that CDN should be able to point to an endpoint of your choosing, be it uh, syslog, S3, GCS, whatever, and basically stream your traffic, stream your logs to that endpoint. Better yet, you should be able to configure what you want logged. So it should be W3C logs, maybe things from a CDN, metrics from the CDN that are valuable to you with each request. All that stuff should be coming to you real time. I'm gonna give you my favorite example of all these examples because it sort of has lots of elements to it. And that's the example of beacon termination at the edge. Who knows what a beacon is? Oh my God, I get to teach you what a beacon is. That's great. Okay, beacons, thanks. You're, come on in, I'll teach you too. Wow, didn't know, unplanned. 
So a beacon is essentially a request that a browser makes with carry, that carries information in it, usually as query parameters. If you ever use Google Analytics, if you ever use RUM or any performance, um, real user monitoring performance tools, if you've ever used ads, targeting, all of this stuff, they all use beacons. And the idea is this, uh, this is a Google Analytics example. Here's the Fastly page. And this right here is the Google Analytics beacon. What that does is the Google Analytics script runs on your page and then it collects a bunch of data like your viewport and who you are and which page you're on and things like this. And it constructs a single request that has all this information as query parameters. So that here the DevTools breaks it down for you. Here's a bunch of stuff that Google Analytics collects. And it sends that to the Google Analytics server through what's called a beacon, which is a single request. In this case, they use a one by one pixel image to, and the, all the information that's important in what's being collected is actually carried in query parameters. This is such a major um, mechanism in collecting data in the, in the Etherweb that um, this actually, there's a beacon standard now. There's actually an AP, beacon API that you can call to send beacons from the browser, makes them asynchronous, non-blocking, blah, 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 blah. What's interesting about beacons is the request and the response, the, re the request is important, important because it carries the information. The response, that one by one image, is completely immaterial. It matters not at all. It's actually an, an invisible pixel. But HTTP says when you make a request, you have to have a response. So there is, there's a response that's sent. But that response gets these like super uncacheable headers associated with it. And because they don't want it cached anywhere in the middle because that they need the request, from the next time that request is made from anywhere, they need that to get to the origin where it's, the data is being collected. So it always gets these super, super uncacheable headers. The way you dealt with this with CDNs was like, if you ever built a beaconing application, the way you did this with CDNs was like this. You put a CDN node in front of your application and you ran your JavaScript on the page and you constructed your beacon and then you wanted to send it back home. So you construct this URL, it goes to the CDN. CDN's like, okay, I can't, I'm just gonna send this home. It sends it home to the origin. The origin basically responds with a little image and it puts super uncacheable headers on it. And all the origin wants is essentially this URL because in the URL there's all the data you're trying to collect. And that URL, that logging essentially goes to some sort of log analysis engine. So you collect all the logs and shove them into an analysis engine and then that analysis engine runs over it, collects it, and then big data, buzz, 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 buzz. That's what happens afterwards. That's how you analyze what's going on. And that's the way it worked, and we could never cache that thing. A CDN could basically provide very little value to this application before. If you take all the mechanisms, we, if you take all the mechanisms we talked about today and put them together, check out how we can use a CDN to do the, to build this application now. Today, we can take that URL, we, we run our JavaScript still, construct the URL, we send that URL, we send we send our beacon to the CDN edge, and we were able to cache that image on the CDN. So we serve the image straight from the CDN. Better yet, we actually respond with the 204. 204 is a special status code in HTTP that says I have nothing to give you, but I'm going to respond because I have to respond. HTTP says you have to respond. You can construct that 204 straight from the CDN. We talked about generating content at the edge. This is an example of that. Then what we do with things like real-time logging is we log that request straight to an endpoint like syslog, S3, GCS, whatever. And that's how we collect our data without having to build a farm of servers that do nothing but log collection. <laughs> Better yet, here's a cool example. If I log that thing to GCS, there's a function I can run in GCS that essentially takes that data and imports it straight into BigQuery. And I've streamlined that, I've streamlined that entire thing and I have a whole application built. And the reason this is my favorite example is because I don't need an origin for this application at all. I built a completely originless application. Beaconing applications are common. Built an in, 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 entirely originless application using a couple of services from a cloud and a CDN node with a couple of features that are important. Now, if that, that log streaming was an instant, we lose being able to analyze data and seeing in real time what's going on. Those are valuable things that we want. This is a very cool example that sort of takes all the things that we talked about together and puts them into one place. And I love this example because it's an entire application without the origin and it uses uh, systems from all over the place. It's very cool. And this is a real application. We've built this a couple of times. 
for customers, and we actually have internal applications that use this. We have a few minutes left, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take a step back and talk to you about what I'm actually talking about with all these mechanisms, which is a bigger picture than features. We're having a feature discussion, but we're actually talking about something bigger. We, what we're really talking about is the fact that CDNs, this notion that CDNs are black boxes that are opaque and we have no visibility into them is a thing of the past. If you're still thinking about your CDNs like this, stop. This is not a way to think about CDNs anymore. They are no longer just a mechanism for content delivery. By adding programmability, control, and visibility, we're doing lots of things with CDNs that maybe we didn't do before. And they need mechanisms to do this, like all the mechanisms that we talked about are vital for us to be able to interact with the CDN this way. But once we have those mechanisms in place, we kind of uh, interact with the CDN and use the CDN very similarly to how we use other cloudy services. And it's cliche, but it's probably not a good idea to think about a CDN as a CDN anymore. It's kind of a cloudy service. That's a better, it's, you can actually argue that CDNs are one of the first cloud services because there were these things that were happening in the ether and they were handling your content. They were essentially content as a service for a long time. Wow, this is a cliche workshop. <laughs> the difference with a CDN as a cloudy entity in the world is that it's closer to the users. That's the difference between a, the, the cloud that a CDN is versus a cloud that things like EC2 are. So it's a cloud that's close to the ed edge users. It, it, it is an uh, edge cloud, if you will. So here are users all over the, all over the world, and here's your, the core, your central cloud. You know how to deploy things on this, and you deploy applications on here. You deploy components, you scale them up and down however you want. Think of a CDN as one that sort of sits at the perimeter. It's the first line of uh, it, c contact between your users and your application, and it's a second layer of cloudiness that you've added to your application, that you've built your application with. That's actually a better way of putting it. So you have the central cloud that does the things that you want to do centrally, and then you've distributed everything to the edge through the use of this edge cloud. So this example that we had before was actually the perfect example of this, right? We use the CDN node as a service at the edge, as a, as a cloudy service at the edge, and we use a bunch of storage and data services in the core of the central cloud. This is a perfect way of thinking about building applications with different components that are sitting in different parts and are together building or, or, or servicing our application. And from this edge cloud, you expect services, just like you expect services from a central cloud, except these are edge services. What are edge services? Well, there's a bunch, and there's probably others. Everything from content, which is essentially CDNs, to load balancing and request termination and request manipulation, geofencing, everything that falls into the security bucket is a service that you can expect from your edge. Things like content transformation, if you're optimizing images, that's a service that you should be expecting from your edge clouds. Building originless applications, maybe even pushing some data to the edge, that would probably make sense. Small key value stores probably make a lot of sense to have at the edge. And basically anything that makes sense to run and have close to your users should be a service you expect from this edgy cloud. So let's think about it in a different way. Here's our ecosystem. And you, built, you build applications and you build them on this central cloud. You already know how to scale them horizontally. You already know how to scale them vertically. The CDN or the edge cloud essentially allows you to scale them radially. Right? And if you think about this whole thing as one big ecosystem, it's a powerful model to build applications through. You have things that are happening close to users where they, where they belong. You have things that are happening at the central uh, cloud where they belong. And you, when you think about scale this way, you, think you, you essentially divide your world into two. You use the edge cloud to run things that make sense to have close to your users, things that are latency sensitive, things that just make sense to run near our users. We want them to be distributed. We want to protect ourselves at the edge of the network. And you run things that make sense centrally, things like compute or data processing or data storage, ETL services, whatever. And if you think about this as this divided world where you run things that make sense at the edge and you run things that make sense centrally, you have a powerful ecosystem to build applications with. <laughs> 
So the way to think about CDNs and these edge clouds is essentially like a platform. And I have here, it's a platform for extending your application to the edge because this is what the title of this talk was. But this is actually not the best way to think about this. The best way to think about this is we're not extending an application to the edge. We're building an application with services that happen to be at the edge. The CDN or the edge cloud is another building, another component that you build an application with, the same way that you've used any other cloudy service. And that's a, once you have your mindset starts thinking about these platforms this way, the, the possibilities open up. Yes, you need all the features that we talked about. Those are all essential. They need to be there. But at the end of the day, if you think about the whole thing as an ecosystem, as a set of platforms that you use um, the same way you've done with any other cloudy service, there's a power there that lets you build applications that maybe you couldn't build before. Certainly more performant, certainly more available, certainly more distributed. That was 50 minutes of talking. You know how many slides that was? That was like 166 slides. I'm very proud of you for sitting through that. I have, I have nine minutes for questions, look. Okay, so you got rid of our origin. You're at DrupalCon, that Hold origin. on, wasn't that cool? No, okay. that, that origin's my Drupal. We okay. just, we're at DrupalCon, we're building Drupal. What the hell do we do in Drupal to make that work? So what, first what of all, don't of stop using Drupal. <laughs> That, that was an example. By no means am I telling you to stop using it. In fact, use it more. How? How do we make it do I, 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 I want to make sure I, I am nice to our hosts. Uh, so the, the, what I gave you was an example of how you could use a CDN to build an originless application. I am not by any means telling you stop using all origins because it makes a lot of sense to have things that run in our origin. You're using Drupal to generate content. You're using Drupal to manage content. All these things are happening and they need to continue to happen. But maybe when you build a beaconing application, you don't necessarily need to engage every component of, an e of a Drupal ecosystem. Maybe when you build some other application, you don't need to use every component. If you think about this as, again, as an ecosystem, uh, you can think about it as building pieces that make sense where they need to be built. Certain things are always gonna make sense to have with an origin, with a management system, with a whatever. And certain things may not make sense because they're uh, 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 more streamlined or don't need an origin, don't need content, for example. So the question, it's, it's the, the, the question is how can you find a way to build applications that don't need an origin? But that's not the take, the takeaway here isn't build applications that don't need origins. The takeaway here is have control over the mechanisms that you use. The same way that you have control over your Drupal ecosystem, you should have that control over a CDN or an edge cloud that you use close to your users. I don't know if that answers your question. It doesn't, but that's the, the, I, by, the preaching here isn't stop using origins. The preaching here is think of edge clouds or CDNs as another building block in your applications. That makes sense. Yes, sir. So I'm just curious, a lot of the use of the edge for things other than just static caching is new to me. Uh, do you have any recommendations for the best way to go about learning more about other uses, like what you were describing, or like tutorials and such, any uh, good resources? With the, it, it, with, at the risk of uh, touting my own company, I think it, we have a bunch of things, uh, so I would recommend that you, uh, I think we're still around if you find the, the red people like back there. Uh, we can probably point you in some directions. Um, there, th th what I'm talking about isn't revolutionary new. Mm -hmm. Like there's others that are talking about using CDNs in a slightly different way that is not just static content. Um, there's stuff out there. I would say we talk about it a lot. So our blog is a good place to start. It is a Fastly blog, so it's gonna be Fastly. Uh, we're really polite, so we don't like, we don't badmouth anybody else, but that's probably a good place to start. Um, and if you, once you start thinking about CDNs as things that can do more, you start identifying mechanisms that you're looking for in CDNs, and then you probably can search by that and find those things, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Thanks for giving the talk. Sure. Uh, just a quick thing about uh, sort of programming the logic-like thing that I feel like I need from a CDN. Uh, and maybe I just haven't gotten the space enough, but uh, is role-based access to content, having the logic for being able to cache something so that I, not just one user can access this, but everyone with the same roles, uh, you can cache once and they can, and they can see it without 
just obscuring the content right. URL or something. Is that, is that something there's a solution for without heavily modifying an application, some way that can be provided to a CDN like Fastly, or is that a uh, difficult, more difficult to solve I problem? Think I think it's to do it probably at the level that you're used to with your RBAC systems is probably too much for a CDN, but we do have mechanisms that basically authenticate and do, um, I wouldn't call it role-based access, but per, uh, or, or permissions, if you will, where you have a mechanism, you, let's say you have a place that has uh, the permissions database, and you have the CDN look up before they let anybody in. They, they serve any static content or dynamic content that has gotta go through the CDN. There's a way to, um, there, we have ways, I don't know about other CDNs, we have ways where you can do lookups before you let anybody in, and then maybe remember that for future uh, purposes. It depends on your specific use case. That tall guy in the back has coded this a dozen times, if not more, so he's a great resource for you to talk to. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? How do we do? Was that helpful? Was that useful? Was all right? Thank you for coming.